Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to be talking about the life of somebody I know very little about, knew very little about, St. Columba. But my guest is my good friend James Tunney, and anything that he finds fascinating, I'm sure, will be fascinating to me. I hope will be fascinating to you as well. James is the author of The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution, The Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism. Empire of Scientism, the dispiriting conspiracy and inevitable tyranny of Scientocracy. Tech bondage, slavery of the human spirit. Human entrance to transhumanism, machine merger, and the end of humanity. As well as two dystopian novels, Blue Lies September and Ireland, I Don't Recognize Who She is. James is an Irish barrister living in Gothenburg, Sweden, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I have to admit our topic of St. Columba is, is very obscure, but I know because I know you, it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Well, I hope I can convince you that you'll be surprised that you have lived up to now without realizing the significance of him. And uh, apropos our talk about Philip K. Dick, it was interesting in 1963 that when he had a vision of, of Satan, if you like, in the sky in California, the church he goes to is St. Columba's Church. Uh, so there's a funny little connection there. So he's a figure that pops up in a diverse range of contexts, and I'm certainly going to advocate for his significance. Well, I guess a good place to start would be with the era in which he lived, which is sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting period, Jeff. And we have to cast our mind back to 6th century Ireland. And he's born around uh, 520, 521, which is why they have been, people have been celebrating uh, 1500 years since his birth recently uh, in Ireland and Scotland uh, and elsewhere. But at that time in Ireland, Christianity had come a couple of generations beforehand. And Christianity coming to Ireland is associated with St. Patrick. And a lot of people forget that St. Patrick was kidnapped and brought to Ireland. So he's, he's not from Ireland. He, he may have been born in Wales or Scotland or, or elsewhere. He was Roman. And uh, he was brought to Ireland and he he had we with St. Patrick, we have things that he wrote himself, two documents that he wrote himself. And in both of them, he has visions like you had visions in, in, in the start of your journey. He has visions which, when he escapes from Ireland, leads him or forces him to go back because of the, how compelling this vision is. But with St. Patrick. And, and whoever and the other people that were there, we have a, a Latin influence because Ireland was never part of the Roman Empire. And uh, with them, they, Latin had to be learned. And as a result of that, the early monastic church became very proficient in Latin and their, their skills in grammar were known uh, far and near. And people came to study Latin with them as well as study other things because people forget Although there has been a narrative for a thousand years after the Normans that that uh, Ireland was a very dark place and very undeveloped, people had been going to Ireland for for hundreds of years to learn from the Druids and and to learn other skills. It has been it was an important place, but uh, so a few generations before uh, before Columba is born in five twenty one, Christianity comes, and in fact. It's one of his relations, supposedly, Niall of the Nine Hostages, who kidnaps or was responsible for bringing St. Patrick uh, to, uh, to Ireland. And he's, 
he's born in, in a place or supposedly in a place called or believed to be in a place called Garton in, in, in Donegal. And he was born into the family that that Niall of the Nine Hostages had begun. And they're, they're a family called the Canal Cunnel, who supposedly my father's family w- was derived from. Uh, I suppose everyone claims people that are successful that <laughs> there a connection there with. But uh, so we're talking about early Christian Ireland, where we had a very decentralized church. We had people who were preaching the gospel, but doing so in a very, very different way. There was no compulsion. They didn't have an army behind them. So they had to persuade the people there. They had to persuade the, the Druids the kings, they had to manifest their powers, they had to be charismatic, and they exercised skills, they exercised, um, they demonstrated their learning, their healing powers in the monasteries, Uh, but it wasn't very, very connected with Rome. And at that time, of course, we begin, we come to the end of the Roman Empire, and a very significant event, which we, 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 we should emphasize, is the year 535. So when, when, uh, Columba, or Colum Kill, as he was also known, when we would call him Columba. When Columba was a teenager, we had the uh, events which perhaps precipitated the Dark Age, that a lot of uh, historians uh, now agree, uh, with the help of science and with the help of extant documents, including fr- from the people that we're going to talk about, that there was a catastrophe in the world, a number of catastrophes, uh, seen to be volcanic eruptions around around the world at beginning in 535 and recurring again perhaps in 540 and 547. So it's seen, there is evidence. I, I was in Java uh, once uh, talking over there and I was in a, a, a little palace called Solo. And in Solo, in that palace, they have written records going back to this period of a massive eruption where the sky darkened. So it seems that Krakatoa or one of the volcanoes over there erupted. But it seems that in the Northern Hemisphere, either in uh, America and definitely, in my view, in Iceland, we had a volcanic eruption, which led to a, a shift in temperature, uh, a two degree fall in temperature, they believe, using dendrochronology and other, other uh, sources that led to famine, that led to the bubonic plague that was instrumental in the fall of the Roman Empire, that was instrumental in the overthrow of the elite class in in Mexico at the time. So there was a traumatic period, and and I believe that this was an important thing which has been neglected in relation to some of these figures. For me, it would have indicated to the ruling class and the Druids that their power wasn't as effective as they had thought they thought it was. They weren't able to maintain the balance between nature and in particular um, the sun the sun that they would have worshipped and the sun was this was perhaps some divine uh, intervention in, in some sense but the, the dark ages has a literal base that there was a darkness and this is recorded in in, in roman records as well and the, the fall of the roman empire meant that that centralized power to look to um, was gone and uh, it facilitated someone like columba from the edge of the known world, from the from the west most westerly point uh, in in the known world, uh, coming back and and trying to integrate his knowledge from the the prehistoric culture he came from and this new Latin cosmopolitan uh, uh, view of the world. Now you mentioned the phrase the monastic church, so I I gather that. In addition to having churches for the population at large, the monastic culture of Christianity was already quite well developed in uh, his day. Well, it's very, very interesting that the monastic tradition in Ireland is most particularly linked to Egypt. So there seems to be a direct connection, surprising to some people, between the monastic tradition in Ireland and the monastic tradition of the Desert Fathers in places like Egypt by the Red Sea. And we see that uh, Anthony and St. Paul of Thebes, who, who lived in the desert in, in, in the 3rd in the, in the and 4th century, they, they're represented on, on, on icons associated with this period uh, in Ireland. And there was a sea connection, as we've talked about before, between Ireland and Britain 
and that area of the Mediterranean. So there's a direct connection, and, and in the references, they refer to the, the Desert Fathers, and they refer to, uh, and then back to Abraham and other figures. Um, so although people believe that the connection is mediated through France and that, the, the, the sea connection w w was always there. Uh, and as well as that, the monks, they didn't, have a, uh, they didn't go for a big centralized church. They were going for uh, a sense of communication with nature. They were living in harmony with, with, with nature. They were observing the moon. They were observing the sun. They were engaged in uh, the arts uh, and they were engaged in healing. So they had a very holistic view. The, the, in fact, the preaching or any idea of preaching is not really what they were doing. They were demonstrating and acting in, in the community in a way that showed that they were useful, that they had skills, that they were competent, that they were knowledgeable. Uh, and even their books and that are, uh, are a lot more than, than, merely, than, than merely text. So, uh, yes, so uh, from this period uh, we, uh, would come Bridget and also figures like St. Brendan. Uh, and St. Brendan is a remarkable figure, just to mention. Um, he is one who, in the, in the 8th and 9th century, we have records which suggest that he, in a boat, sailed possibly to Iceland and, and to America. Other people believe he sailed s south. And in, in 1977... Uh, an Englishman called Tim Severin, from the records, recreated how he made his boat, where he sailed to, and he, in a letter boat with others, got to Newfoundland. And recently, people think a lot of the scholars now are getting a bit, uh, they seem to be a bit informed by scientism, and they're beginning to say, oh, well, this is not true, this is fantasy. Uh, recently, in December, there was a paper published which showed that it wasn't in, in the Faroe Islands, which are north of Scotland, that the first people there were there hundreds of years uh, before the Vikings and similar in relation to Iceland. And the records say that Irish monks got to both places. So, I mean, they were, they were in this monastic tradition was drawing on some interests that were there beforehand. They were very, very skilled. And it's, it's nothing like the sense of Christianity that we uh, that we have now in many senses. And it was definitely embedded in nature and definitely respected uh, nature and figures like Bridget and that, in fact, may have been recreations or informed by the pagan goddess was there. They, they weren't trying to eradicate them. They were trying to, to create a fusion between the two. And if I heard you correctly, you mentioned the term Stone Age culture as if Columba was something of a bridge between a, a much more ancient culture and Christianity. Uh, I, I, I was referring to the prehistoric and in the sense of uh, prehistoric and historic and the period being defined by the advent of writing. While there was writing on stone, the writing in the form that we know today really comes from this period and Columba is associated with the first uh, writings in the Irish language and uh, Latin and, and, the, and translations of the Bible. So we're moving from an oral culture. It doesn't mean it's not as sophisticated, but they don't concentrate on storing things in the same way. They use their memory. So we know that lawyers, it was an oral culture. So you had to remember all the precedents. You had to be skilled at talking, using your, your memory. And that, and that idea of competence and oral skills w w was very, very important. So when Columba begins to record things, as he does, as we'll see, um, we're, we're, we're talking about the start of the history of, the, of Britain and Ireland fr from these records. And not only that, people, people are very uh, believe that they were very, um, they were against antipathetical towards the pre-existing culture, but it's from them that we have some of the records of what the existing legends were. So they, they weren't, that, that, that's, that's an unfair accusation about them. So it, it's the start of writing in that sense, in, in the the use of another vernacular as well as the Latin language, uh, the, the first literature in Western Europe apart from the, 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 the Latin la language. And uh, so in that sense, he bridges it. And for me, he what he does is, uh, there's an idea that it's a zero-sum game and, and that uh, what happens was the Druids were displaced by all these uh, miserable Christians that came in. That's the kind of narrative that, that, that you read. But really, I think it was the other way around. I think what happened was, 
that the Druids and the magic class were uh, were weakened. And there was also plague. There was a lot of people died. There's various estimates about half the population of Europe died uh, at this time, according to some. Um, so they were dying. Uh, and I believe that Columba and others sought to integrate the pre-existing knowledge, pre-existing skills of the Druids and that with something that was useful from the from Christianity. And in particular, that was uh, an attempt to mitigate the harshness of a warrior society. And we can see that one of the uh, the main biographer, uh, Adam Non, uh, he's also associated with the promulgation of a law to protect non-combatants in war, to protect women, children, and other non-combatants in war in, in the year 697, 100 years after, after Columbus' death. So this shows us an interest that they have. So this is, this is reckoned to be the first example of jus in bello, of, of, of law of war, a first humanitarian international convention, because it was facilitated by Adam Nunn. So this shows us our interest. They're seeing they're going to marry. And, and the great symbol of that for me is the Celtic cross, which has the cross and the sun around it. So that shows to me the metaphor, motif, of fusion, which which is an accurate reflection. Well, what little I know of St. Columba is that he he took a journey. He took a journey by sea from Ireland to Scotland, where he established a monastery. And uh, I, I presume that was a journey over the waters of several hundred miles. It depends where you start. It's not a very long journey. If you stand up on the coast there, you can look across and, and see where you're going. Although he wanted to get out of sight of Ireland for, for a number of reasons, it's not that far depending on where you start. So, um, in fact, the that part of, of Northern Ireland and Scotland were united in a kingdom called Dal Riada or Dal Riada at a certain stage. So they were very, very close. And, and scholars now talk about the Northern Channel. To, to indicate that they were closer because of the sea connection than some other places without roads. So it's, it's not so much that it's a, it's, it's a long journey. It's certainly remote and it's certainly it's consistent with the idea of going into the desert. So many scholars see it as similar to going into the desert, you're going into the salty sea. I don't see it in quite the same way. I believe that there's a deeper, there's a deeper logic to it, that it's like the Vesica Pisces and, and the, the Mandorla, where you get your two circles and the strength comes from the, the joined part, that Iona is between Ireland and Scotland and the central point between them is very, very important. And I believed also that they were interested in the north and this is indicated in some of the, in Adomnan's uh, Vita Columbae, the life of Columba, where they talk about Cormac who travels 14 days northwards uh, and uh, consistent with Brendan, who came by Iona on his journeys. And why were they interested in the north? Well, according to the, if we go back, back to Moses and, and the, the Bible and, and the Christian and, and, and Christ himself, the idea was that you spread the word to the ends of the earth. So people that were spreading the word had to go to the ends of the earth. And I believe that they, they knew that there was some place to the north because birds came from there. They could possibly see the volcanic eruptions. So there, there, and in fact, I believe that the the Celtic symbol itself may have come from the parhelion, which is an optical effect in particularly noticeable in cold climates. I saw one a few months ago, which which uh, I saw as inauspicious, and I think it was. But it's it's where the sun shines in the sky, and you see four dots. In a cross. So the Celtic cross is actually a representation of a natural phenomenon that's particularly evident in cold climates. And I think they may have seen it a bit more at this time or when they traveled north. And uh, th so, so that northern element was important. So it was more like a crossroads. So when people see it as a purely, uh, a purely punitive, self-imposed journey, I'm not, so, I'm not so sure about that. And he settled on the island of Iona, which even today, I think, has a population of less than 200 people. It's very remote. Uh, it's remote. A lot of people visited it. And, and surprisingly, you said that the small population, you're correct. But um, it's amazing that there's over 60 kings buried on the island as a result of, of him going to this 
uh, deserted island. Some people believe it was a Druid's island, but there was also a lot of Druids dying from the plague. So I, I don't know about that. But um, over after his 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 work, there's over sixty kings, including Macbeth, who who, who who's buried there, uh, and some Norse kings as well, Irish and Scottish, Pictish. Uh, it, it's quite uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, story. So we have an example of someone using a margin, uh, a remote zone as a power zone, and even the coronation of kings. The idea of the coronation of kings with the divine hand probably comes from there. It, it, was, it seems to have been a bit later with with the, with the with the French, and he, he. So so there is a big network that he creates uh, from here. Surprisingly, from its marginal aspect, but if they were looking north as well, if they were conscious of the north, uh, and uh, that possibly may also explain, as well as their efforts to contribute towards the Christianization of Scotland, because there was other people, there was Mungo and, and Ninian, and later uh, Augustine, who who brought Christianity there as well. So he's not the only one, but he's a significant. In, uh, influence on, on, on bringing Christianity to, to, to Scotland. And I understand that Columba is regarded as one of the nine, I think, nine apostles of Ireland. Uh, and I presume that's a reference to what you've referred to earlier as uh, the Celtic or Gaelic monks from Ireland sort of rejuvenating Christianity throughout Europe. Well, there's an interesting, the idea of a saint at that time was different from later saints because the saint at that time became a saint by acclamation because they didn't have that centralized structure that they had later. So it's more like a high level martial artist at, a, at the very top where the other people recognize them as, a, as similar or having reached a certain level that's far beyond. So there was a number of changes about who, how many patron saints Ireland had, but there was a great uh, efflorescence of individuals who took the message and they had great charisma and were able to utilize and demonstrate powers. Now, this is a very, very important thing about the Celtic Church. It seems that the individuals had to demonstrate power. They, Although uh, Columba becomes a historian, he, he becomes a great copyist, a, a great illuminator, a great writer, a great poet, uh, he had to demonstrate practical powers in order to, to get their position. So in some way, the people that were motivated to do this job uh, had to have powers first. They had to be able, they had to be figures that were very imposing. And perhaps as a result of that, and as a result of the unique uh, confluence of the pre-existing Druidic tradition, uh, which which worked in many ways, and the new knowledge, that fusion and juxtaposition created a synergy that led to uh, a, a golden period, uh, the Island of Saints and Scholars, as it was called. Some remarkable figures that come from, from there. And they're remarkable now. And even uh, that, uh, what do you call it, Star Wars, uh, in one of his recent films, they, they go to Skadig Michael, and they fill him on Sk Skellig Michael, an island in the sea off the coast of Kerry, where the monks of this generation would have built a very remote uh, monastery on the top of, of a, a very rough uh, island. They were driven to connect with nature. They weren't afraid of nature. They were fearless in, in, in many senses. They were educated in, in astronomy, uh, in the stars, in, in science, uh, and they, they, they knew how to to navigate as well, which, which was important. So um, over a period of time, the uh, Patrick becomes regarded as 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 the most important saint. Uh, although um, I, I think Columba is remarkable as being a real figure that comes from Ireland with a, a, his own unique take take on Christianity, which is not conditioned primarily by some central authority, and this is the the beauty, if you like, of a decentralized approach uh, to it. As a result of Iona, what, what happened was that the community that grew over 100 and 200 years was the source of the re-education in Christianity and learning uh, to Europe. So a lot of 
uh, monks of that period, including another one called Columbanus, who went to the area where Joan of Arc lived and later on to Italy, they brought learning back. They were educated in how to calculate Easter, for example, and that's where the, the term computus comes from. So computing at that time was computing the date of of uh, of Easter associated with knowledge of the heavens and the lunar cycle and, and the solar cycle and how they interacted. And that was a great uh, matter, a, a, a bone of contention between the centralized church and the Celtic church later on. But they brought it and they were respected and Charlemagne and that would have had monks that came from Ireland. They were knowledgeable in, in certain things. They were knowledgeable in healing and plants. And uh, many of the monasteries in Europe uh, during the Dark Ages were re-established or set up by Irish monks from that tradition. One of the results of this monastery on the Isle of Iona was possibly the Book of Kells, which is an extremely important historical document. Perhaps you should have mentioned that Columba is associated with arguably the first copyright case in the world. And, and, and there's various debates, a lot of historical debates about whether it is true. Contemporary historians are saying, no, this is not true. It was a later medieval. We know it came from the medieval period. Uh, and therefore, uh, that, that story is not true. I'm not so sure about that. Historians get it wrong. Uh, I agree that the uh, it seems to be a, uh, from the medieval period and we have to sift through the information. But there is evidence uh, of a, a legal, uh, from that period, of a legal dispute involving uh, Columba, which led to where he's copying the Psalms without consent at night in uh, a monastery owned by Finian. And he's discovered and they have a legal case. It goes before the high king and the high king gives a decision. And the decision was to every cow its calf, to every book its copy. Whoever, by analogy in a, in a cattle owning society, whoever owned the cow was entitled to own the, 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 the calf that came from. And the same analogy was applied. Now, for me, this has the authenticity of a genuine copyright dispute about it. And in fact, some of the historians say, well, actually, uh, this was a later medieval or uh, and there's another book in five, uh, 1532 written about, about it. It was from later on. But copyright in this form hadn't developed. Copyright of that era was about management of propaganda, if you like, the, from the, in the time of uh, Queen Elizabeth. And, and the, the management of copyright was not to give rights to the author in, in that sense. So I'm still I'm skeptical about what the historians in, in in that context. But anyway, he do, he, he does certainly the first uh, the first written book and uh, or one of the first written books emerging uh, from the islands is is uh, a book that he he he's uh, accepted to have or most people accept that he wrote called the Cahawk, uh, and it wasn't very illuminated, but it, w it was the start of this tradition. And the Book of Kells is is generally uh, accepted to have come from uh, Iona. And the Book of Kells, of course, is is a, one of the greatest illuminated documents uh, in the world. And it's very, very, very important in relation to Christianity and uh, world culture. And uh, the, the Book of Kells was very significant in its influence on James Joyce. People forget about that connection. So James Joyce was heavily influenced by this period in, in Irish uh, monasticism and by the Book of Kells. And that influence also came down uh, through Joseph Campbell, who, uh, who was very taken with this idea of the monomyth and, uh, and this, this the textual approach in Finnegan's Wake. And also it comes up in relation to Robert Anton Wilson and Terence McKenna. So it was, it's a very, very profound influence. And there are still many secrets in, in, in the Book of Kells. So also... There's another book, the Book of Duro, uh, the Book of Lindisfarne, are associated with Columba or the monasteries that he was associated with. So that, that contribution towards uh, literary culture, towards beautiful illuminations uh, was very, very important. And also his defense of poets. He went back to Ireland uh, to, to defend poets. Uh, there's other traditions say he doesn't, but this this defense of poets was very very important, and he wrote poetry. There's there's an, there's at least two poems that most historians accept he wrote. Uh, so it, it was it was a very different idea. It was uh, the idea of a monk artist. It's it's actually similar in a way to the Zen traditions, 
with uh, calligraphy and and engagement in the environment and respect for the environment and and if you want to call it sustainability or living living in in a uh, piece with nature uh, as well so the book of kells is one of the great contributions and the the high crosses although people associate them with saint patrick that the, the high cross which is a very important uh, sculptural contribution from this era is believed to have come from Iona with influence from the Picts in its design uh, and, and other influences. So another great contribution, another great symbol. And just one point on that, Jeff, before I go on. The the uh, writer who, who died, I think, last year, uh, Crichton, uh, Crichton Miller, believes that the the Celtic cross represented a navigational device and he patented a navigational device based on it he believed that the monks had made a navigational device which enabled them to to discover angles with a plumb line using the celtic cross to to discover angles that they could position themselves in relation to the stars and they could calculate the movement of the sun uh, and, and moon so that they could they could plot their course when they were traveling and uh, in fact, if you look at the alleged f first, the oldest analog computing device, which is the Antikythera, which is believed to be about 2,000 years old that they found in the, uh, in the early 1900s in, in the sea, the structure of it is the same as the Celtic cross. It's, it's quite remarkable. So there seems to have been some technology associated with navigation, associated with the stars, associated with the heavens, uh, which was going around at the time which is another kind of uh, representation and an idea that the symbols in the heavens become practical symbols, become practical tools, that there's, it's like, uh, as I've suggested, the path of light before, that there are signs and clues by how light in the heavens behaves and how that influences uh, our world and, and can be used in a practical sense. So whatever became of the Celtic Church, was it reabsorbed into uh, the Roman Catholic Church? What happened was that there was, a diff there was different forces in, in the church. And uh, at the same time, we had a, a church that looked more uh, to Rome. And there was certain uh, Augustine and others um, brought a different brand of, of uh, Christianity. And there was conflict between the Celtic, uh, the Irish, Welsh, Scottish, um, English uh, monks, because there wasn't all it wasn't based on national identity in that sense. There was conflict between the Celtic monks and the more centralised-looking monks, and and there was two issues. There was one was about their tonsure, their hairstyle, and but the main one was about the calculation of Easter, and. That, so there was a tug of war, and at a certain stage later on, there, 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 there's various forces of separation, uh, and this is a this has been a very unfortunate and unfortunate process because we begin to get a, a centralizing a centripetal tendency, in my view, towards towards Rome, and actually Columba is a figure that appeals both to Protestants, although they might not be very keen on the early saints they do the saint patrick but saint columba in particular is a figure that has joined protestantism and, and catholicism he remains relevant to protestantism and they see him as a forerunner of their church and there's something in it there is something in this decentralized element that's that, that is quite attractive and actually when we go back to the later monastic or the later monastic traditions as they become powerful around the uh, 10th uh, 11th century or 1100s um, we see our old friends the burgundians and others who exert power over the monasteries so that although columba uh, was involved in politics he was a, di a diplomat he he was involved uh, with uh, events that were going they were trying to be honest brokers at a certain stage elements of the church become controlled. And this is a problem. It's a problem today. It's, it's, it, in my view, it's one of the reasons why Christian or Catholicism will, will collapse because of the use of, of, of the church for political uh, and materialist uh, uh, goals. And, and some of the, uh, it's another debate we can have so, uh, sometime. I think it would have been stronger if we had have had 
local genius, if you like, allowed to flower, allowed to impress itself instead of this uh, a dreadful over centralizing force. So uh, it's uh, for it was strong for uh, a, a a couple of hundred years, and it was strong on the continent. Uh, it survived, but remember when the Normans come in 1169. They're coming with supposed authority from the Pope. So this, this is quite remarkable. Uh, they're coming with supposed authority from the Pope for the conquest. So there had been this, this uh, uh, non-acceptance of elements of, of, of the, the insular church as well, which is, which is very unfortunate. And the interests of that insular church in Wales, Scotland, Ireland and England seem to have been closer to nature, figures like St. Cuthbert, uh, for another figure, they were closer to nature, they seem to have uh, certain practices, I believe that they, they used the sweat lodge, for example, this is, I've always believed that, but it seems to be being rediscovered, they seem to have swam in water, which I'm very fond of myself, they engaged in, in actual practices of engagement with nature, obs observation of nature. And these were things which were lost with a centralizing church, which became too associated with, with royalty, with, with, with other interests. Uh, and um, uh, it, it couldn't, it, it, it was also attacked by the Vikings. We have to remember that the Vikings, who uh, in, instead of turning to to Christianity, when they saw the dark skies, they seem to have turned to a darker, a darker force. Their, their perhaps worship of the sun god, then perhaps some people believe, turned them to a, a darker sense of, of 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 the world. And they came at the end of the eighth century, and they attacked the monasteries. That's why the Columban monks had to move to Ireland to Kells. That's why. Why the book is associated with Kells, and they devastated and and they they slaughtered some of the monks on on, on the island. Uh, I think they might have, they could have exercised self defence there, but they, they they weren't. They were genuinely preaching this gospel of of non violence. Uh, so the Vikings had had uh, they raided, they they slaughtered, they took away the 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 jewellery, the art, the sacred shrines. Uh, they took slaves as well. Um, so uh, the Vikings. And centralization were important factors and tensions within the church and also tensions between different brands of monasticism as well. Now, we've had several discussions going back a couple of years, James, concerning your books on mysticism and your emphasis, as I recall, of individual sovereignty being very important on the mystical path as well as the experience of light being uh, a central experience for you. How do you evaluate St. Columba in the light of your writings on mysticism? This is the, the very, very important part of the sto story, insofar as it's relevant uh, to your work, uh, Jeff. There's a, there's a whole range of stories. Um, and again, if we, if we take that source that was written about 100 years after his death, it's written by Adam Non, who's also a relation of his are from the same family, the wider family. Uh, and this man, Adam Non, is a very important figure. As I said, he, he promulgated that law in 697. He also, he's also the person who wrote the first guide to the Holy Land and the holy places around the Medi Mediterranean on the basis of interviews that he had done. And this remained as a kind of tourist book, if you like, of the holy places for hundreds of years, uh, years afterwards. Uh, so he's a significant chronicler. So he records on the basis of interviews with people and on the basis of word of mouth. People forget how strong word of mouth is, especially with the mobile phones. They forget that in other cultures, I've seen this in Ireland, people remember things. They listen They listen to stories like a dog might wait on a bone or a cat wait, might wait on a mouse. They used to, to get the stories to remember them and they did remember them they, they, as part of, of their cultural thing. So he would have had access to good sources about what happened uh, to Columba. Uh, he's, he's, he's close in time to him and he's, he's in the same place. And he interviewed people that would have been involved in these stories in some way. So his book is, is described as hagiography and that, that's what it is. But 
There's, uh, historians have a, a terrible tendency now to disregard everything in hagiography. So by hagiography, we're referring to a particular type of tradition which celebrates the, the, uh, the saint and is therefore seen to be like a trader's puff, as they call it. It's seen to be just marketing. It's seen to be just selling, overselling. And therefore, they dismiss the elements of truth in it. So certainly there are elements in it that are more difficult to, to, to believe and others that are trivial. There's a whole spectrum. And in the center, there's a whole range of stories that are totally consistent with the literature and parapsychology. So, I mean, there's a whole range of trivial stories, for example, about he predicts that an ink pot is going to be knocked over by a monk. And you say, well, that's not anything special. And at the other end of, of the, uh, the scale, there is uh, the story of him turning water into wine and revivifying someone that had died. So you say, okay, well, they may stretch uh, credibility a bit, a, a bit more. But in the middle of it, there's a whole range of detailed descriptions of prophecy, of predictions, of observations of nature, such as observation a grey cloud, observing a grey cloud, which came from the north, which I suspect came from a volcano that he knew was poisonous, observing birds, uh, observing whales, telling people that it was dangerous to go on the water because there would be whales uh, there. But there's a whole lot of prophecies where he's saying, this is going to happen, this person's going to die in this particular way. Endless amount, of, uh, uh, well, not endless, but there's, there's a lot of them in there. Uh, and, and he's obviously, obviously seen to be accurate. There's remote viewing permeates the thing. People are wondering what happens in Ireland. And he said, oh, those two kings have, have died in, in battle and it's proven to be true. He, he knows what's happening. He tells a visitor to the monastery that he, is, he asks him where he lives and he tells him that his house has been raided as they speak, but his family are going to be okay. Endless kind of uh, or repetition or cycle of prediction, uh, prophecy, uh, remote viewing, being able to see what happens, being able to see a volcano uh, in Italy, uh, being able to see souls going up into heaven. He sees souls going up into heaven when they die uh, to contribute towards your study on, on consciousness beyond death. He sees the figures going and he sees a battle in, all, in, in, in many cases between the demons and the angels for the soul as it rises. So it's a bit like that film Ghost, if you remember, uh, that, that kind of depiction of, of the point after death. But um, so many historians would also dismiss those stories. But if they look at the literature that you've uh, spent your life looking at, they wouldn't find a lot of these stories. It's a corroboration. In fact, it's an example of, it's proof uh, of, uh, or corroboration of, of the persistence of, uh, of these stories. Also, he's the first person that we have an association with the Loch Ness Monster because it, the, the story tells from, from that time that a monster uh, appeared in uh, the River Ness, going into the Loch Ness, and he exercised control over it. Uh, so there's another interesting little story there. So we have cryptids involved as well. But that's that's recorded. That's been there for, for a long period of time. But in relation to light, for me, this is the most interesting aspect of his life. In in all the stories, but in, in also in this uh, uh, hagiography, biography, um, they, they tell... Now, Adam Nolan is not telling all about his life, where he came from. People said, oh, they didn't tell us why. They didn't tell us. It. He's concentrating on these parapsychological phenomena, if you like. Um, and he describes that from the time he was born, when uh, Columba was sent to uh, be brought up with a foster mentor kind of figure, uh, who, who was a Christian, and this was this was traditional in Ireland. You were you were sent out to people in the family or to other people to to help with your education. That this figure knew that this was a great. He knew that this boy was great because light was seen. A ball of light was seen over him when he was sleeping. Now th this phenomenon, as you know, occurs in other contexts. When he goes to uh, Iona, there's many stories of the phenomena of light. There's stories of people coming across him when he's in the church at night and there's a blinding light around him and they hid away and Columba says to them I'm glad you hid away because it's it's too blinding for you to uh, to come to and people peep through the keyhole and when he's writing they hear strange incantations and strange light coming from his fingers 
Uh, These stories are recurrent about the association of him and light. When another saint comes, they see a pillar of light over him. When he dies, a pillar of light is seen in the sky in Ireland, um, uh, associated with him going into the next world. Um, so so the, the light phenomenon uh, is, is recurrent uh, through all the stories. And I believe that this is actually consistent with the stories that we have in, in, in other contexts, in, in diverse cultural contexts. And one very interesting story is, he's with the monks one day and he says, I'm going out to a certain place and I don't want anyone to follow me. Uh, leave me, no one is to follow me. Uh, I forbid you to do so. Stay here. And he goes out and lo and behold, one of the monks, of course, <laughs> follows him. Uh, and he, uh, the monk, uh, after his death, describes what he saw. He said he came to uh, Columba and Columba was there in this place in Iona and there was beings from the heavenly uh, world, light, well, angels, he says, had come down to, to, to converse with Columba. Now, this is a, a kind of remarkable story. Now, Columba knows that someone is afterwards and he challenges him and he says to, he says to him, well, don't reveal this uh, during my life. But we have a, we have a description of, uh, well, you can call it hearsay if you want, but, but of someone uh, who, who witnessing him communicating uh, with light beams. And the last point on this, there's a remarkable, there's a remarkable line by Adam Non, by one monk. He, he says to Columba, how can you do all these things? How can you have all these, these powers? Uh, how do you know all these things? And he said, well, don't say this when, when I'm alive, but there are some people who can see as if a, a a light or a sunbeam could travel around the earth and they can see things in that way. So he's describing the ability as being associated with something akin to a beam of light that enables him to uh, to have connection with distant places. And it's a remarkable description. And the last point, Jeffrey, uh, why it's still relevant to people in, in the domain that you work in is it gives us different descriptions in Latin to distinguish between different people. For example, Adam Non describes contests uh, between Columba and magicians. Now, the magicians are described as magi, or using the word magus, uh, as, uh, as magicians. They don't use a word associated with druids. And they are distinguished from sorcerers, which I think he used the word maleficious. So we have a hierarchy. We have, at the bottom, is these sorcerers who are up to no good, not doing, uh, and Columba believes that they use the devils and demons and other lower beings uh, to to facilitate their, their 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 magic. Then we have the the magus or magi. You might call it the ordinary decent magus. Who they're not they're not criticizing them, but the uh, the idea is that the the Christian magician has to demonstrate their superiority. So they're not so condemnatory. They're condemnatory about the magician who holds on to slaves, for example, because they, by now they become anti-slavery. They want to free slaves, they want to free hostages, and they engage in this activity as part of their, their peaceful work. So Columba is, for me, a fusion of the magician and the, uh, the holy man in the new tradition. So he's not disputing that the, those powers are there. In fact, he's incorporating, he's assimilating them, and he's adding to it the new power that that has come, and perhaps there may have been uh, things may have been changing by the time he went to Iona in five sixty three. There may even have been a bit of Thanksgiving bit element because he's forty two at this stage. He goes with twelve monks. There may have been another element that, in fact, there had been a demonstration that the new magic with the combination of the traditional and the the new uh, was working. So as well as uh, as their their contemplatio, the contemplation and the lectio, the reading and the other activities and the illumination and the sculpture and the navigatio, the traveling and the, 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 and the peregrinatio, the, the moving out in a pilgrimage. Uh, they, they had a holistic uh, kind of view uh, which vindicated, it vindicated the new power. And in fact, he's demonstrating through his competence. And that's another, another f factor his competence in diplomacy, uh, in illumination, in poetry, in, in art, 
uh, in prophecy, in, in, in all the different things, is another feature which we know is consistent with people who have had genuine mystical experiences in that kind of virtuous cycle. So he's a great example for me of uh, the phenomenon of light that should be taken seriously. And if historians now come along and say, well, this is hagiography and they dismiss it, there's a certain disenchanting kind of scientism with some historians, there's great historians as well, great historians working on Columba, um, people like Brian Lacey and on Donegal and, and, and people like that who are working uh, on Columba. There's a lot of people around the world actually uh, working on Columba. So I'm not, I'm not denigrating their work, but, I'm, but what I would say is if they properly want to navigate this literature and to distinguish between the wheat and the chaff, as they claim to do, they have to then engage in other sources in parapsychology uh, in relation to a kind of triangulation of sources. And if there is the evidence, the, the evidence from Adam Nahn, uh, consistent with uh, practices elsewhere, they can't merely dismiss them as just uh, hagiography or just something made up or something that was done traditionally or just it was something to done uh, to copy some other saint's story. So I think actually there is a, cross, a very important crossover that has been forgotten about. And I think there's a useful and fruitful dialogue that could happen between some of the people that study in in this domain of parapsychology and some of the historical sources, some of the accepted sources about some of these figures who are real figures who have exerted a powerful influence and still do exert powerful in influence. And also that the there's something in the mystical tradition, in the monastic tradition, that is relevant today. And people are thinking again about community. People are thinking again about non-violence at a time we're hearing drum beats of war again. We need honest brokers. We need people that are in touch with nature. We need people that uh, want to protect the vulnerable. We need people that have some commitment to some higher sense of order, uh, an order in that sense of logos in which they were they were trying to to relate to. And I think uh, some of these figures are uh, inspirational, remain inspirational, and should do. And we can learn lessons from them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that, that that's why he's relevant relevant today. And the light story is still relevant. Well, James Tunney, once again, you've convinced me. I, uh, <laughs> I'm impressed with n not only the life of St. Columba, but I realize that parapsychologists would do well to make a careful examination of the life stories of all the saints and all of the traditions. There's a wealth of material there that often gets dismissed, as you say, as exaggerated hagiography or superstition but there's much to be gleaned. So I owe you a debt of gratitude once again for keeping me so well informed about subjects that you are so passionate about. And I'm happy to let our viewers and listeners know that we plan to continue these conversations for, I hope, a long time. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's always a pleasure. And you have Santa Clara over there in California. And Santa Clara, of course, and this is later when it's documented, uh, was able to project a mass, to, to remotely view a mass. And she's regarded as a saint uh, and accepted uh, as a saint. So remote viewing and all these, they're not works of the devil as, as some later Christians claim. To. Th these are standard fare in relation to to holy people, spiritually evolved people. And I think that there's a danger that in the empire of scientism, uh, not only is it attacking uh, parapsychology, but it's attacking a, a wider spiritual process. And there's something to be gained. Uh, th there is that uh, potential fusion, that potential synergy uh, to, to be gained by, by examiner. But thank you, as always, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for being with me, James, and for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.